to put on our backgrounds or just uh, leave uh, blood? I, I, yeah. I request that uh, members, panelists, you put on your videos so that uh, as our participants are coming in, they are seeing the the, the panelists. Mm -hmm. So let's put on our videos. Uh, <clears throat> it's 2 p.m. in Uganda, and uh, I welcome all of you uh, to this webinar, uh, which is on uh, chat GPT and its implication to teaching and learning in higher education institutions in Uganda and beyond. We are going to have uh, uh, an engagement uh, on this topic for about uh, about one and a half hours, uh, where we shall have uh, panelists presenting on key topics that we have decided on, and then uh, later on we shall have an interaction and a Q and A session where we shall have our audience uh, participate in uh, providing comments, providing questions providing solutions uh, to, to the different, to the issues at hand. Uh, uh, with you today, I am uh, Paul Virevo Muyinda, uh, who will be moderating this webinar. Uh, I am uh, a professor of open distance and e-learning at Makere University, and also the director of the Institute of Open Distance and e-learning. Uh, before we proceed, I would like to introduce my panelists uh, here, who are here with me uh, that are going to be dissecting and uh, are engaging in this discussion. I will start my introduction with uh, none other than uh, Professor Umaru Kakumba. Uh, Professor Umaru Kakumba is uh, uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Affairs at Makerere University. And uh, he's also a professor of business management and uh, <clears throat> very, very interested in uh, issues to do with uh, uh, digital teaching and learning. Uh, he's indeed the convener of this webinar. Uh, he's working together with the Institute of Open Distance and E-Learning to convene this webinar. Uh, second on my list of panelists is Professor uh, David Sarada. He's a professor in the Department of uh, Disease Control and Environmental Health in the School of Public Health at Makerere University. His area of interest, his area of research is in uh, uh, infectious disease epidemiology and uh, is a known professor in research uh, related to HIV AIDS. He has been in this area for 35 years researching on HIV AIDS. Uh, but is also interested, so much interested in the use of uh, digital education, in the use of digital tools in teaching and learning and research. Uh, third on my list is uh, Professor Joseph Valikudembe. Uh, uh, Professor Joseph Valikudembe is the Dean of the School of Computing and Informatics at the College of uh, Computing and Information Sciences at Makere University. Uh, his, uh, actually, his area of interest is in software engineering, particularly requirements engineering 
using AI, using artificial intelligence uh, for software development. So uh, he is a professor of computer science and therefore also interested in artificial intelligence. And then uh, next on the list of panelists, we have uh, uh, Dr. Jamia Mayanja. Dr. Jamia Mayanja is a senior lecturer in the Institute of Open Distance and E-Learning at McKellar University and is also an instructional designer uh, in the same institute. Uh, she's also interested in uh, emerging technologies, especially AI, how AI can be used in teaching and learning. Uh, next on the list then is uh, Dr. Uh, Diana Nampija. Dr. Diana Nampija is also a lecturer uh, in the School of Distance and Lifelong Learning. She's interested in mobile learning for community development. And that's where she professes. Uh, <clears throat> next is uh, uh, Dr. Godfrey Mayende. Dr. Godfrey Mayende is uh, uh, a lecturer in the department, in the Institute of Open Distance and E-Learning, and also an instructional designer in the same institute. And then uh, last but not least is uh, uh, Mr. Richard Kajumbla, who is also a lecturer in the department, in the Institute of Open Distance and E-Learning, and also an instruction designer. But all these panelists of mine are all are all interested in uh, the use of all in research in emerging technologies for teaching and learning. So uh, <clears throat> without much ado, I, I would like to uh, commence our webinar uh, with a brief introduction about uh, this webinar and why this webinar is being held at this time and uh, to, to, to usher us into the reason, the background as to why we are having this webinar is none other than our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Affairs, mm -hmm. Professor Umar Kakumba, who is indeed actually convening uh, this webinar. So I want to hand over the microphone to Professor Umar Kakumba. Over to you, Professor Umar Kakumba. Uh, many thanks to you, uh, Professor Paul Muyinda for your generous introduction and uh, a great pleasure colleagues to be here with you, Joe, those joining us. Uh, the number is growing, quite excited. And I convey to you greetings from Makere University and also colleagues, uh, I want to bring to you uh, the appreciation of the effort that uh, has been initiated in uh, arranging this conversation. We are here, ladies and gentlemen, and our uh, participants joining this webinar. We are here to appreciate uh, the emerging um, you know, changes and transformations in the area of IT and how IT is affecting higher education. As many of you are aware, the world will never be the same because the world is not sleeping. The world is thinking ahead of time. And uh, for us, if we don't change or if we don't adjust, we may be swept off okay, you know, from our feet, and then we may not be able to keep afloat with the demands of uh, the contemporary world. When you talk about artificial intelligence, when you talk about uh, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, there are many, many things that will continue to emerge. And those of us who are in the field of uh, uh, training, generation of knowledge, conducting research, teaching and learning information, we must be closer to those changes. So the whole purpose and overarching rationale for this uh, we, we, uh, uh, webinar is to appreciate how far is uh, higher education uh, contributing or being ready uh, to uptake the emerging digital technologies, the applications and the transformation. While we are today talking about chat GPT, as an intelligent system or tool or engine that can easily monitor someone and then be able to um, provide information and quicker, you know, intelligentsia to somebody to, um, to be able to find solutions or to make decisions or to make actions. We are saying that the, 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 the policies must be addressed. We are saying that we must appreciate 
because universities traditionally are very, very traditional institutions. Universities like um, uh, the judiciary or judicial systems, they are highly regulated. They have policies, okay? They have regulations, but they also have individuals who are academics who are trained in particular ways of thinking. They are endowed and are deeply rooted in their theories and, and something. So, so those theoretical propositions need to be integrated with emerging technologies. So it's opportunity here for us to have the conversation, appreciate what are the opportunities and prospects that are coming with ChatGPT as one of the artificial intelligence uh, systems or tools that are emerging. But we're also here to appreciate what is it, what is it that it can do, okay? Uh, what is it that it can, uh, there are ethical issues that are involved in, uh, in, 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 in chat GPT. There are issues of plagiarism. There are issues to do with, uh, uh, you know, surrendering uh, all of the powers to, um, to, 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 I mean, surrendering all the, all of the responsibilities, abdicating the, 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 the role of the student, okay? to the machine so that the, the thinking is relegated. So we have a lot to do. Should we relegate thinking, uh, creativity or innovation because they are intelligent systems that can provide us information? The question is no. And people must have qualifications. People must have skills. People must also be empowered to innovate. So once the innovations are there and they can do what we need, shall we stop thinking? The answer is no. So today's conversation, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just giving highlights of what to expect, but there's a lot that the panel will be bringing to you. For me, I want to thank IODEL, the Institute of Open Distance and E-Learning. Makere University has uh, set up this institute as our strategic um, you know, uh, structure that is mainstreaming uh, the open distance and e-learning. And a lot of issues will be expected from the institute. It is uh, headed by Director Professor Muinda, who is our moderator for today. But we also want to look at uh, uh, issues to do with the uh, health sciences, medicine, public health, where we are, uh, have the opportunity to, to have the likes of Professor David Serwada, who is uh, a distinguished researcher and a professor emeritus, uh, who will be sharing with us experiences of what the world of science and health is uh, thinking about these intelligent systems because people can be operated, okay, without being touched or the machine is there or when they are far away eh, from, the, from the hospital and then they are working on them. They can diagonize, they can do what. So this is part of the modern artificial intelligence that is coming in. Just a simple machine some puts, will put on their body will be able to tell the medical expert to identify what ailment or problem they are having and then they can even do operations without opening, eh? without necessarily opening the, the... So there is a lot to expect colleagues and IODEL will be uh, regularly, uh, will arrange a program to be bring us these webinars so that we can appreciate. And at the end of the day, we should be able to appreciate as uh, high educational institutions, but also the variety of the stakeholders, including students on how we can be able to um, leverage these opportunities without losing a lot as a uh, as faculty, without uh, you know, losing the, the opportunity to think and be creative because we will have surrendered the thinking to others that have developed the systems. And, and, and that's what we, we, we want to do to be proactive. Colleagues, I don't want to take a lot of your time. My simple task was to open this and give introductory remarks. I only said that to excite ourselves uh, and, and see what is going to be uh, shared into this. But this will not be a one-off. It will be a continuous a program that the IODEL will be arranging so that at the end of the day, we try to see how we can participate uh, in these new digital technologies and emerging innovations. Apart from that, I thank you very much for honoring this uh, uh, you know, um, webinar and uh, for participating. Please let us listen in, let us contribute, let us engage. Uh, thank you so much for listening to me. I now take the opportunity to cede back the microphone to the moderator, and I wish you good interaction in these conversations. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, our convener.
Professor Umar Kakumba for that wonderful introduction on what we are about to experience. Uh, yesterday, there is a staff who told me that uh, a student had come to them to say, I had failed to complete my research 10 years ago, but I found a tool which can be able to complete for me my research. And now I have come back, I want to complete this research. Now, I want to see how this research can be completed. We are now going to invite the Dean, Faculty of Computing, uh, Professor Joseph Balikudembe, to show us, to tell us how, what, what is artificial intelligence? What does it entail? What is ChatGPT and some demos? Is this student's uh, expectation possible uh, about this thing, doing research for them? So tell us what is this uh, chat TPT, what is artificial intelligence, and why are we really getting so concerned about this chat TPT? Uh, Professor Joseph Balikudembe. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Um, I hope you can all see my screen. Yes, yes. Uh, so quite briefly, uh, before we get into the conversation of what GPT is all about, uh, it would be unfair to assume that everyone understands what AI is all about. But a quick run through on this wide and diverse subject is just to explain the idea of artificialism and where uh, uh, this tool evolves from. So every human being has a brain and uh, as you grow up, there are things that you, you learn from the people around you and understand. So the, the proponents uh, of such technologies looked at the human brain and uh, wanted to develop uh, technologies that mimic the exact behavior of a human. So when we talk about AI in this instance, if you have a dog at home and uh, uh, you are training it for security reasons, uh, you train it on certain conditions. For instance, if you drive close to your driveway and you're returning at the night, you, you tell it to, to sort of go around your car three times to ensure that uh, no one is uh, around and uh, to sniff for, to give you basically a hint that uh, security is uh, all set and good in good condition. Or maybe it could wag it, its tail maybe three times, etc. depending on the conditions that you give it. So now if you were to replace that dog and create a robot, you'd want to implant that exact brain that the dog has into this robot. So the idea of AI is to look at this behavior and then model to, to such conditions that you would exactly have the same kind of behavior like the dog, uh, the actual dog would be. And of recent, at least you've seen, uh, 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 those who have developed a technology on um, artificial intelligence wife or something around that. So where they believe that the role of a woman in a home can be recreated by this kind of technology. So that is sort of uh, 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 some bit of an understanding of background of what AI is all about, the artificialism. So, but getting to this technology, it also evolves from this. So they have looked at, uh, uh, the such behavior of uh, users of information evolving from what they call uh, chatbots. So if you've been to certain corporate uh, uh, websites, you've seen uh, those small uh, pop-ups that come up with uh, 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 trying to help uh, find information. They ask, what is it that we can help you with? So that is sort of the background in there is a chatbot. The biggest challenge has been that we browse the internet, maybe you search through Google for information. Why is there a war between Russia and, uh, and Ukraine? You get millions of returns coming back and you cannot sieve out the exact reason. So it is up to you to digest which one and you take. So the proponents of uh, this technology have tried to aggregate this and provide it as a conversational tool, problem solving tool, a tool that can do quite a number of things, which we're going to chat about in a while. So, but the bottom line is that uh, as a user, you should be able to find information as quickly as possible, which is relevant to boost productivity and at the same time, uh, uh, understand uh, uh, or aggregate information, which would rather be difficult for the start. So, 
the information that is provided here that they use for modeling, uh, it is up to the September 2022 and uh, sorry, 2021. So, and it, they're using about 175 billion parameters. So when I talk about 175 billion parameters, uh, it's just about uh, the patterns or the behavior that they expect uh, things that one can do uh, uh, with such a tool, the conditions that you can use to get to closer to uh, the kind of information that you're looking at or what your target is all about. So in this we have, um, uh, I've highlighted some of the key use cases, which I call use cases, are things that you can do with this tool. For instance, uh, simple questions. Uh, you can ask simple questions. Uh, who is the, uh, the, the, the oldest person on earth? So, and can give you that answer. To generate a list of uh, ideas, uh, it can also provide uh, long form written pieces, just like we shall see later on. Solving complex problems, being an instructional guide, modification prompts, among others. So uh, I'll, I'll quickly run through this and then demo at the end, just to show uh, the power that this has. So in the simple questions, you can put anything, but uh, say you can ask uh, what is the current total global population, any question that you want, and then gives it to you. So you can also use it to, uh, uh, to generate a list of ideas. Um, I'm, I'm using some examples here, create a list of ways to pass exams for a student who has limited learning abilities, attends to uh, thirds of uh, the semester. So again, it will give you a list of that. So the more you refine and add uh, the conditions that you want, for instance, they don't pay fees on time, it can be added as a, another condition. So it is. Uh, it would expect that um, you know exactly what you want. So each time you add more of uh, the conditions in here, so it will, it will help it identify exactly uh, uh, which particular area uh, that you're looking for and then generate based on that uh, relevancy. So also you can uh, create uh, long form written pieces. For instance, an email, uh, documents, lease documents, etc. So for instance, if you tell it to write a congratulatory email to John who has been promoted to a new senior position and include famous quotes from Nelson Mandela and Churchill, so you get that email quite uh, ably. So I think whoever is dealing with communication skills or teaching communication skills, so again, you see that uh, if you're having a student and you're giving them uh, Maybe it's such a simple task for the start. They have a tool that can do it for them. And if you're law, uh, instructing uh, students in law and teaching them how to draft legal documents, you tell them to create um, a list document for rentals. So you'd include all the parameters and then this would uh, just uh, generate a document for them. For, 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 for them. And uh, they can tell it the number of pages that it must generate. So also it can be used to uh, uh, solve complex uh, problems like write essays, math problems, paraphrasing, translating to another language, uh, lengthening something or rewarding something that it does not appear plagiarized. I've provided a sample in there for, uh, for a question, sort of a, a common maybe statistic questions I'll show at the end, where you can pick a number from a paper, a question paper, put it into the tool and then it gives you an answer. So if you are to verify the answer, so when you're an instructor, then you would want to see if this is correct or not correct. So depending on uh, the, the, the modeling right behind. So the other uh, would be it being uh, an instructional guide. Uh, for instance, how do I make certain re recipe, uh, recipes? Sorry, there's a, a type of there. How do you commit suicide? But that is ethical, so it will tell you as it was modern not to do that. So how to cook matoke so that it will generate. Also, if you wanted to uh, provide a modification prompts, so it can uh, translate, uh, reward, and lengthen essays, among others. So uh, here, uh, relating to what Paul said, there's a capability to modify data from text. I took this article off the internet uh, where you just give it an instruction to say, okay, look at this article, can you uh, just tell me what uh, problem that is being researched? Now that you've given me that problem, uh, can you output that as a, as a research statement in a thesis? 
And then uh, uh, after it, uh, it gives you that uh, statement, uh, you can say now you can uh, convert that into a keynote address for conference. And then you can strength, uh, 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 lengthen the, the, whatever the output to maybe six pages. So regardless, uh, but I'll show you just now in a minute. It can also be used as uh, a conversation and advice. So uh, if you want someone to speak to or basically converse with, so you can ask it questions and gives you answers. So for instance, if you say, I'm thinking of stopping to drink alcohol, but my heart is still so strong for it, what should I do? So uh, it can give you the answer. And then you can say, now, can you explain it to me? Like I'm a five-year-old. So again, it will evolve and give you uh, a five-year-old answer. So um, I just want to quickly take you through um, uh, 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 a demo. Um, yeah, so uh, it will be good. I would assume you go to AI.com. So you create an account. So the usual um, account creation process, which I've already done on my side. And then when you go to ChatGPT, uh, so it provides uh, the interface for users. So I'm not going to go through all the different uh, shortcuts, but it keeps a history of all what you're doing. So I already have an article here, uh, which I took, uh, Understanding South, South African Mother's Challenges to Adhere to Exclusive Breastfeeding at Workplace, uh, a qualitative you study. You can share. Professor, can you share that screen? Okay. You stop sharing this one, then you share the other one. Okay, let me just uh, share. You can, can you stop see that sharing now? The, you stop sharing the one you are sharing, then you share, uh -huh, then now you share another one. Okay. So I took this article. Yes. So, okay. Which is... Uh, uh, understanding South African mothers' uh, challenges uh, to adhere to exclusive breastfeeding at the workplace. Just now, I guess Google and uh, that one. So, but uh, if I'm reviewing the relevancy of this and I don't have time, I'll just take the introduction where it stops and uh, just copy up there. And then I'll go to. Go to my uh, GPT. Oh, okay. So, and I say from this test, uh, what research problem is being investigated? So, for will basically uh, take some time and then generate. So it, it will give me a, 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 a basically a brief of that. Then I would say um, uh, convert that uh, to a statement of the problem or a thesis. So again, it would change that and give you uh, uh, basically, a statement of the problem for thesis. Then I would say, uh, convert that to a keynote address for a conference. So I'll be reusing it the same. So basically, to help me quicken this process, I've been invited to speak and uh, I don't have time. And then um, I could say, now lengthen this. to a five-page document. So it keeps on looking for uh, relevant information uh, just to ensure that uh, it gives you all that. You see it is giving you the abstract, the introduction. So for the student who feels that they have got a tool to help them write their thesis, so I think you can see. So it creates an opportunity uh, for, um, uh, 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 for working and, and also uh, looking at uh, saving out whether this is authentic. So now if you're teaching programming, I'd say uh, generate uh, a script, a PHP uh, script 
to validate non block non registered users. Block non registered uh, system users. Um, uh, so for us who are teaching computing, so it will, it, will, it will give you the code that you're looking at. So, and, and then, uh, so it will generate that. And uh, for a student who is doing uh, computing, so that would uh, <laughs> happen. So you can uh, do quite a, a lot on this. Uh, now I can say convert that uh, to an API, uh, uh, a Java API. So when I'm, I'm looking at different languages, which I'm playing around to see. So now it's going to give me an output uh, of an API, which is in Java language. So when you have students, we are giving practical to do programming. So I think you can see uh, how smart they can get to get all this information out. So there is more that this tool can do. So even if you take a, a mathematical problem and you just insert it and say solve, uh, for instance, uh, let me just stop and I just show you quickly. Uh, this one before I close. Um, Sorry. All right. So uh, for the process of time, so if you have a mathematical problem, you can just extract uh, the exact question, put it in the, the tool and say solve it to give you the answers. So if you have an SC and you just copy and paste it, uh, you just say critique the SC. So if I'm copying someone's work and I say uh, for this, uh, just change it that does not appear plagiarized. So it will be able to uh, do all that for you. So this is just a quick uh, demonstration for the purposes of time. Mm, and uh, it would expect uh, I would expect that probably when you have time, you 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 log into OpenAI, play around with the tool, and see uh, what comes out. So looking at those uh, use cases uh, uh, maybe, and also play around with it and see uh, on the power that it creates and uh, opportunities that it creates. So I would like to call uh, upon uh, my uh, uh, co-presenter. Uh, Dr. Godfrey Mayende, uh, probably to give more insights on this and uh, uh, we we'll wrap up our, our presentation. Thank you. Yeah. No, so I think time is up, uh, Joseph. We can proceed. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. oh, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Joseph Balikudembe, the Dean, uh, School of Computing and Informatics at Makere University, for this wonderful illustration of what artificial intelligence is, what its potentials are, and uh, its, its affordances are. You can, uh, you can see that uh, our education system has to be worried because somehow somebody <laughs> will say, we don't have, as teachers, we are going not to have work because uh, the, the whole system can be able to do for you whatever you want. Uh, this of course calls for uh, awareness from the teachers, because if I'm a teacher and I don't know that such a system exists, then I, I, I will just see all my students being very, very bright because they will be providing me with a very articulate solutions. And therefore I will say, I have a very bright class, but yet the class actually is not schooled. They are just copying from somewhere. So that's why Makere University comes up as a leader to say, yes, members, we have uh, this particular tool, how do we transform our teaching and learning processes so that the learner still remains with something, the, the learner can get something, uh, can be able to earn the degree or can be able to earn the skills that they are supposed to earn and yet also co coexist with this technology. Uh, we have come to see that uh, with this technology, there is no student at Makere University who has complained they don't have a laptop, they don't have data, they don't have so, because the technology is there to work for them, so everything's perfect. Everyone has a computer all of a sudden. And I can assure you that 100% of our students at Makere University have, in a way, utilized uh, this chat GPT to either answer an assignment or do something. So, the next uh, presentation uh, is uh, 
actual presentation, which I'm going to, it's just not a presentation, but I am just going to, to give uh, some uh, pedagogical uh, aspects on how the teachers can be able to use these teachers and students, how they can be able to use this uh, technology to be able to remain relevant and also to learn, not necessarily to just copy and paste. So I gave a question at the beginning, which said, are we still relevant as teachers? Are we going to remain relevant or not? And uh, my answer is a very big yes. The teacher is still a very relevant person, even when this technology comes on board. Because now what this technology is coming to do is actually to automate the teacher's uh, work by trying to provide the teacher with more time to, to support this learner than more time to prepare notes, to prepare content for the learner because the content is there. But now the teacher, the teacher's role has to change. The teacher's role in terms of assessment also has to change. The way we assess teachers, I mean students, has to, to change because if you are just asking students to give you uh, 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 maybe to, to, get, to regurgitate something for you, the students will just go on chat GPT and they will ask chat GPT to bring out uh, whatever information that you want and they'll give it to you. So uh, that means the teachers have to be more innovative. The teachers have to be designers of learning. They, they are not designers of instruction, but they are now designers of learning. You have to design the learning process so that the learner now is more taking the stage than you as the, the teacher. You as a teacher, you are providing uh, a stage on which the learners can be able to uh, to to can be able to 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 perform. So a number of uh, applications, therefore, can be put to ChatGPT. Uh, for example, the the teachers, as I said, should should help the learners to be able to generate their own content. Gone should be the days when the teacher should be the master of the content, where you have to give notes and so on. The notes are out there, but what you need to do is. Now to design learning activities that learners can use, uh, can, where learners can be able to use the, the resources available to them, including the resource of ChatGPT to be able to apply. So generation of on the fly teaching and learning resources uh, is one of the things that ChatGPT can be used to do for the learners and for the teachers. As the teacher is in the class, I can be able to generate notes by asking the learners, you, we are going to talk about a human reproductive organ. And I don't have the notes, but can we generate these notes uh, by using the devices that we have? Then they can generate, and then you, from there, you can be able to pose questions based on that, uh, on whatever notes have, have been generated. Also, uh, we are increasingly now using it as a reflective uh, uh, teaching and learning tool to have the, the learners be able to reflect uh, the, 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 the equations are there. The, 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 the code, for example, Professor Badu Kudembe has just generated a code using chat GPT. The code is there. Can you be able to, can the learners now be able to reflect on that code and be able to, to see, for example, why is an if statement being put where it is put and not where it was not supposed to be put? That kind of reflective learning uh, <clears throat> by providing the, the learners with different topics, and then you ask them to reflect on those topics. Without, and then they can go to ChatGPT, generate the resources, and they give a reflection on what ChatGPT is actually indeed providing. Of course, it can also help the learners in engaging with each other because in, in learning, we, use, we normally use what we call social learning, interplay of minds. You want learners to, to interact with each other. Now, if you want learners to interact with each other uh, and they have different resources that have been generated, ChatGPT has generated the resources, another one has generated maybe from Google, another one, they can bring together that rich, uh, com uh, rich combination of knowledge and interact with each other and engage with each other so that there is more rich, a rich learning experience. So, so, so that there is, more integration, there is more integration of activities and more engagement with the content uh, that is at play. So, because content is everywhere, uh, we can, the learners also are becoming co-creators of knowledge. 
they are becoming co-creators of knowledge. So it is gone are the days when the teacher is the sage on the stage. The teacher is there just to facilitate the teaching and learning. But the, the, the learners can also now be able to generate knowledge. Uh, gone are those days when uh, the teacher will say, I am the only one with the knowledge. You cannot be able to challenge me. You have to let the learners challenge you by bringing in what they know and therefore create a rich learning experience, create a rich learning space where there is co-creation of learning. Uh, and this co-creation of learning increases, it enhances the learning uh, process. And uh, <clears throat> we do, we now also talking about uh, chat GPT as uh, improving teachers trainings, communication skills. The teacher, for example, the, the teacher trainees or the learners, how co communicating, because as you can see, chat GPT can structure a, a communication or a, an essay very well. And therefore, if a learner can be able to also mimic that the way chat GPT is trying to answer or to write a, an essay, you can see that it is improving, uh, it's improving the learner's communication skills. Not only the learners, but even the teachers. Uh, so this is uh, coming on board to actually improve communication. It improves the communication. Somebody who didn't know how to write an essay can be able to mimic what chat GPT is writing and also be able to follow that. Then uh, uh, the teachers are now increasingly using it also for assessment. You know very well as teachers that uh, creating of questions uh, can become a daunting task, but, but uh, teachers are now using chat GPT to generate assessment questions, questions that they can give to their learners for formative assessment or even for summative assessment. And chat GPT is also becoming an assistant teacher. It's an assistant teacher. When I'm in class and uh, I am teaching and I need to get a resource, then I can ask chat GPT to get me that resource and I enhance my teaching. Therefore, chat GPT is becoming my assistant in the classroom it, to, to, assist the, to assist the teacher, but also to the learner, it is a, it is a, it's a, peer, a, peer, a, a peer teacher or it's a peer learner, meaning that it can scaffold the, the learner on what they don't know by quickly have, making them get access, access to it. So ChatGPT is a scaffolder in the zone of proximal uh, development. And it, it can also be used as a personalized uh, uh, learning tutor, because I am moving with my gadget, maybe my mobile phone, and this is my tutor. I can ask them questions at any time. So there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of pedagogical applications that we can put to Chat GPT, and these pedagogical applications are indeed already happening. They are taking place. But I want to invite my colleague Diana to fire, to give more opportunities if she has more that she can be able to add to this list that I've given. Thank you, over to you, Diana. Thank you so much, Professor, and good afternoon, our viewers and listeners. I think you have mentioned most of the things, but one thing about chat GTP is uh, it's coming in to help the low income countries and middle income countries get access to content because you all know the challenges sometimes we go through. So they start one opportunity that we have this rich reservoir of resources where our learners can actually get access to this information, but also information in different designs and in different modes. In this conversation of educational technology, we are talking about universal design for learning. Here comes a, a, an AI that is giving you different, different versions, different languages on how you can, you can, you can maneuver and interpret information. So I think for me, it's about that inclusive call that yes, we have these resources and they're available for everyone. Of course, it has the challenge. It has the challenge of uh, access, inequity, but at least the, the, there are vast resources there we can always use. Back to you, Professor. Thank you. Yes, uh, Diana, as you, as you continue, of course, a very good thing normally comes with a lot of challenges and practical concerns. And indeed, chat GPT, as you can see, uh, is coming with a lot of practical concerns, especially within our education system in Uganda, where flexibility in learning, sometimes flexibility in teaching is not, uh, is not something very common in Uganda, but it has come 
and here it is with us. So what are those practical concerns that we must take care of as we, uh, as, as we, we actually get affront, uh, confronted with this animal called chat TPT? Thank you, Professor. Um, there are so many practical concerns, but as we think about the practical concerns, there is that bad side of uh, chat GPT. When, you, when, when Professor was demonstrating how this tool is, is, is really helping someone even to come out with a statement of the problem, that means that we are really struggling with academic integrity. You know, how will we know that, you know, this is original information from our student? So you notice that, you know, there is conversation about laziness, limiting creativity, you know, that, you know, our, our learners will just be out there, you know, just going in there to just type in and then they get these answers. And of course, in, in turn, it impacts on memory retention. It promotes laziness, reduces creativity, but also increases an academic dishonesty. So then what do we have to do as people in this space? Because we are not going to continue to say that we should limit this as a university. I know Professor will talk about the practical in, uh, uh, implications, but I mean, we can block it as Makera University here, but our learners are everywhere. They will go out somewhere and then they will ac access this technology. So I think it is high time we embrace it it is high time we get to know how it works. And it was also high time we get to help our colleagues, our, 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 our learners, students, and whoever is involved in this education journey to understand how the tool really works and uh, to get the best we can get from this, this particular tool. So uh, when, when Professor shared this webinar, my brother, my brother came to my inbox and said, oh, you're going to present about chat GTT. And then he just told me, I can't to like I can't to like leave us alone. We are benefiting from this, and it's not a student currently is working in URA. But you notice that it is not only being used in education as we are here, but also people in revenue in everywhere in marketing. They're making use of this tool already. So as educators or people in this space, how best can we use? Now the first thing is the significant overhaul in the in the assessment. We still have challenges with yellow notes. We still have challenges where people set low level questions and you have presented how we can even get questions. The students will be in position to enter this space and generate different questions. So that means that even in our assessment approaches, you know, there has to be a change. There has to be a strong change. And of course, we really have to support our learners to critically think and become independent learners. Critical thinking and independence in learning. Gone are the days when we were talking about pedagogy and andragogy. Now we are talking about heutagogy, self-directedness in learning. You know, how are we going to nurture that learner who will get to know that when I come in this chat GPT space, I'm not only going to get information primary information, but it should be something that is going to add on to my understanding and not to just submit the essay per se, that, but that requires training them in critical thinking and, and independent learning. But of course, it's important for research. It's important to generate ideas. All these different ways, you know, how professor was demonstrating. I mean, they're very good for learning. And as teachers now, we have to support our learners navigate these digital spaces. That fear of navigatism, I know Professor Mayende will talk about it, but learners have to be navigators of this information. We really have to help them understand these spaces, fetch and nurture. But of course, as teachers, <laughs> we also have to be up there. We also need to know. I know from the humanities section, especially many of us here are wondering, what is this animal called chat GPT? Some, some of us don't know what it actually is. And it's high time that institutions are planning for capacitation exercises. You know, we need to think about how we need to train staff, continuous webinars like these ones on how we can, for example, help someone to assess using chat GPT. I mean, we shouldn't run away from whatever it is, it is giving us. 
But of course, we need to, again, bring out the complex ethical questions in regards to academic integrity. Thank you so much, Professor. Back to you. Uh, yes, I know, I know really there are so many practical concerns and I know that the audience is reeling with uh, uh, these practical concerns. But uh, here we are, we've been confronted with the chat GPT and the generative AIs. Uh, but uh, maybe I wanted to ask your colleague, uh, Dr. Jamia Mayanja, who is a professor of marketing, uh, what are some of the uh, practical concerns that uh, uh, the people in marketing are finding with the uh, chat GPT? Uh, thank you, Professor, and good afternoon, our listeners. Uh, we really have to appreciate that uh, these uh, uh, technologies are here to stay, but we also believe that while they are very powerful in many cases, they might not be in position to uh, maybe to repress humans. So there, there should be a clear understanding of when and how to, to incorporate these technologies in different disciplines give it marketing, be it education, we need to know when to apply them. Find they can help us reach many people who are widely dispersed, but uh, that human touch is also very important when it comes to, to different disciplines. Now like marketing, we believe that anything can be marketed, even you can market space, even you can market anything, but uh, you can use uh, this chat, uh, chat GPT when it comes to e-marketing because we really teach it in e-marketing. But there are instances where that human element has to be present to really convince a person that uh, this is what we mean by this. So they, they enhance the disciplines, but they might not necessarily replace the human being in the different disciplines. Likewise, in education, like Diana has emphasized, we all need to train these people to effectively use this not to, to misuse because there is using and misusing. So once they are misused, then they are going to affect the performance of our learners. They're even going to affect the performance of our teachers. So we need to know exactly when and how to use these uh, technologies, uh, especially when we are encountered maybe with complex issues because they have the information which is worldwide and which is generated from different sources. But also the, the, the issue is to verify the sources because it might not really give us the, the, maybe the author, but if we use other search engines, we can verify the sources which has been given to us by chat GBT so that we can apply it consciously. Thank you, Professor, and over to you. Uh, thank, you thank you very much. Uh, 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 Dr. Jamia. Now, uh, we come to Professor uh, Serwada. Uh, professor, you are a visiting professor in a number of world-class partner universities in the world. As you said, as, as, I, as I introduced you, you have 35 years of experience in researching on HIV AIDS, not only in Uganda, but also in uh, the USA, UK, and so on. And uh, you teach in many of these universities as a visiting professor and so on. And uh, I know that in those universities, artificial intelligence has been the, the thing. They have been using it. For us here, it's just emerging in Uganda. We are, we are just kind of seeing it as emerging. But it has been the norm in many of these universities where you have been a visiting professor, a visiting researcher, and so on. So can you share with us some insights and experiences from those partner universities, especially in the USA, on how they're using these generative artificial intelligence systems like uh, ChatGPT. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paul. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to a wider audience here on my experiences uh, uh, visiting other universities and how they are using AI. Uh, 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 I'd like to first of all clarify one thing. Um, this webda is really talking about chat GPT, but I think chat GTP is important to point out is just one, it's a chatbot. It's just one of many, many AIs out there. Basically, chatbot is really a computer program designed to stimulate human into conversation all interaction through text, all uh, voice. So there are so many 
chat box and chat GPT is just one of them. And out of interest, I actually do not use chat GPT much. I actually use the Google uh, chatbot called BAD. And I'm gonna tell you why. Uh, but it's important to know that uh, when you just look at uh, Facebook, there are like 300,000 uh, chat box uh, out there, programs that uh, have different functions. So chat box tends to be a little bit, chat, chat GTP tends to be a little bit more popular because it's an open, a, or open or AI, it's very widely available. But it has just become widely available since November last year. But turning to my, in January this year, a group of academics from Makere in, in, in School of Public Health, we were responding to a, a, a notice of application for funding. And I asked members on the table, uh, how many of them have ever heard of chat GTP? January this year, staff, Makere staff, none had had, none. And then we quickly ask them to register. You, you go register your email, whatever. And then we registered. And then I asked him how to write. Can you write an intro? You know, we prompt to set prompts and ask what can we write an introduction to the subject we are talking about? And he started doing the introduction. Everybody was amazed. And then it said, can we write? Can we prompt it with the right prompts to write the methodology? It started to write the methodology. It's a very powerful tool and it's becoming very powerful. Chat GTP has released its first version now. I just recently came out, Chat GPT 4. It's amazing. But here's the point. In my travel, I had a chance to spend uh, about four weeks uh, last this year, in, you know, April, May. Uh, in John Hopkins, I was stunned. First of all, the first thing, this technology has left the train. This technology is coming, whether you need it or whether you like it or not, is how to manage it. So the first thing, because I was very keenly interested in this technology, so while I was there, I had chances to attend all workshops, uh, to attend everything that had to do with AI. And the first thing was, I wanted to know what is the overall university approach to this? So I was very impressed. The first thing in January this year, there was a message from the Office of Academic Affairs, one written to staff and one written to students about AI. It's not specific about chat GDP. As I said, chat GDP is just one of many chatbots. And what is interesting, the message that was went out to staff was also copied to student. The message that went to student was also copied to staff. In essence, if we start with the staff, it was actually imploring the staff the implication of chat GTP on academic integrity and what its implication would be in designing your courses and assessments. And it informed staff that there will be a number of workshops and training. And it sent out several articles to inform staff. Now, it is so critical that staff have what we call AI literacy. And this involves data literacy and algorithm literacy. Staff needs to know what kind of tool AI is, if you are going to understand how the students are going to use it in your assessments or assignments. So this AI is such a very powerful tool. I, I was amazed from as a star, how a demonstration of actually feeding just the raw data and then giving 
chat GTP the right prompts, it can go about generating the codes to actually do the analysis you want, and then be able to actually do the introduction, the methodology, the results, and the discussion. So basically, a student can actually generate, go pick up his data, do his field data. If you have the right skills to generate the right prompts, it can actually write you a paper or write you a dissertation. But now, staff have to learn how to actually recognize that actually this output is AI generated. And these are the workshops that we need to have available to staff. Because there are softwares that are now available. Chat GTP has its own software to detect that this product has been written by Chat GTP, for example. But there are so many other sophisticated software. You can either paste a sentence or paste a paragraph and then look at it and generate probability that it was generated by AI. But staff need to know about this. They have to get themselves. Very skilled staff can actually read it and be able to figure out. For example, AI-generated sentences tend to be short and they tend to be, you know, they, there's a tendency to have a pattern of repeating certain words and sentences. But staff has to be knowledgeable because if you're going to understand that this is a work generated by GTP or AI, you have to understand it. So staff has to use it. You have to keep using it. And by the way, as Joseph said, the more you use it, the more it learns about you. You'll be very surprised one time when you generate it, you ask a question or to, you know, to design a paper or to write a, an essay for you. And it is really, generates a lot of your personal, feeds in a lot of your personal uh, information. For example, I was asked to write an eulogy for one of my friends who had died. And uh, I was using BART, not chat GDP. But it was able to know that I actually had lost my mom and dad. Because the more you actually use it, the more it's also collecting information about you. So it's a tool that you have to know. And this is not unusual. If you go to Amazon or any other, it always corrects. Then one day it says, oh, by the way, you might find that this is very useful for you given your previous buying habits. So it is actually collecting a lot of information the more you use it. But I think what the universities have instructed staff is they haven't created new policies as such, they have actually referenced, particularly the, policy, the policies on ethics that are there, particularly regarding cheating and plagiarism. Those are the policies that are feeding in there. They have also empowered staff and the students know that a staff can restrict the use of specific tools in the answering or carrying out certain assessment. And that is usually put priori when they are giving out assessment. This is restricted in your assessment. When you use it, because you have been told priori, when you use it, and then we detect that you have used it, then we are talking about either cheating or just copying. But you have to let them know right from the beginning. And actually they have also encouraged as we are writing courses or as we are writing syllabuses to actually put in the parameters to what extent this can be used. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you uh, later on from my practical experience. You, it can actually be used very creatively. It's just that if you copy and paste, that is really plagiarism. That's no question, it's, you have cheated. 
and there are ways of figuring out how that is there. So I think the takeaway message here, especially to the academic staff, they really need to get themselves to understand how AI works. And in order to do so, you have to keep using it. After some time, you would assess its capability. Um, actually, staff, once you do that, uh, staff actually can use it to actually ask questions. Or you can have a teaching session, then you can ask the uh, chat GDP, what are the questions I can ask to students? And then you generate, generate the questions. They generate the questions, staff generate questions. But if a question has been generated by chat GDP, it can actually be answered. You bet it can be answered by chat GDP. But staff uses them to prompt what actually students are likely to answer their questions are. Or staff uses it to actually generate questions. In fact, I attended a section on how to, how to generate questions that cannot be answered fully by chat GDP. Uh, I have 10 minutes, so I can't go into the details. But we have now to train ourselves to be ahead what are the questions chat GDP can answer? And what are the questions that it cannot answer? Or if it has answered by chat GDP, how do you detect it from uh, when the student provides, provides this answer? So in cases where you use chat GDP and you are trying to quote a certain uh, text, it is now required in many uni in this university to actually make a disclaimer that this particular section, it has to be fairly limited, is generated by chat GDP. But the more you actually generate, uh, put claimers or texts that are generated by chat GDP, from faculty's point of view, it's going to lower your mark, although you have put the disclaimer, because you're actually using or generating, the basis is that the information you are using to put into your assignment or whatever is not completely generated by you. It's not your own work. You have just typed in the prompt and AI has generated it. So it is not your own original work. So uh, certainly if you become fairly forthcoming, yes, but maybe it will lower your marks. So I think, Makerere University needs to look at its actual policies on cheating and plagiarism and really try to strengthen them in view of what we have. And the student, I've found that the staff have been given a lot of leeway there. Whether it's open book or closed book, especially open book, to what extent you can actually, if you have an open book exam, the staff is at liberty to say, no AI to be used. If you use it, you have cheated. So the staff sets the parameters priori to students to what extent they can use these tools. And if in the afterwards they are found that they are, then that is where the problem is. So I think it is a lot of us to get that. However, uh, Use of, chat, of AI is, is almost 100% by students out there. So our staff, the use of staff, especially, and this was very impressive to me, elderly staff, I'm interacting a lot, I've collaborated with very senior teachers of mine, they're already using it. They're using it uh, to start uh, you know, typing, uh, you know, I can actually ask you, write me a reference uh, of Wilson, uh, all of uh, Paul Muyimba, a reference to a particular job. It will generate it, then you can't start editing it and being able to do it. So they are equally using it, but as I pointed out, what are the practical use? I'm going to talk to you, what are the practical use I've found in these universities, they use it. So starting with students, I think I've found that uh, uh, the, the, the most important thing that students do 
is actually to use chat GDP to overcome writer's block. A writer's block is you are given an assignment and you really don't know how to start, you know? And, but when you put in when prompts for this assignment, chat GDP may generate ideas or must start generating ideas. And then you find, oh, okay, this connects. Then you start to use those ideas to actually in your own words, to start to put together uh, you know, your course assignments. Uh, or it can be used to brainstorm research papers. For example, I have found students who are looking for research papers on a particular topic and they do not know and say, look, I'm interested in looking at malaria in under five in Uganda, which are the areas that uh, you know, require more work. And it can generate the topics for you that, uh, you know, that it feels that this is an area that then you can go re-verify, figure out whether this is area. So, but originally you had no idea. So it, it becomes as a sort of a seeding uh, point for ideas. But one thing I found very interesting, and I hadn't realized this, is students are actually using chat GDP, especially foreign students, are using chat GDP by starting entering text and paragraphs, and then they ask chat GDP to rewrite it in a grammatically correct English. So students who are having English as a second language have really manipulated chat GDP to write for them very well grammatically uh, correct English verbs, punctuations. To be honest, uh, even Ugandan students may need this because when we are writing or evaluating uh, you know, responses, the English is really, really going down. But they intensively use this, you know, students from French speaking, the Chinese, they are writing essays. The staff tells me they write essays. They are not exactly copied, but what happens is uh, when they put in what the ideas they want, then it generates, then they be able to modify. You see, these, these, uh, these programs that are actually looking for sentences that are generated by AI, they are looking at a pattern. They are trying to look at probability. It just gives you a probability that 50%, 60%. But the more you actually change and modify, tweak the sentences, tweak the ideas, it becomes less and less uh, uh, you know, detectable. But you are basically putting in your ideas and effort as opposed to just regurgitating the sentence that it has given out. The other thing I found very scary is that uh, students use, so we are talking of chat GDP, but students are using so many other chat box. There's the AI not taking software. So you're in a class, you are lecturing, the students has an AI talking software. It's basically recording and turning it into text and it can link it into a fact finding uh, software. And then, excuse me, sir, uh, you said something like this. Um, my, you know, uh, this is not exactly true. They had the right notes. Uh, so the AI note taking is actually writing all the notes, fact changing, fact, you know, fact finding what you are actually telling them. And then they just be able to look at that. And then, but they start, what happens is that the teachers are also using their own I not. Uh, taking not software. And the student, once the students have actually done their own notes, they can actually use Jack GDP to say, what are the possible examination questions that can come out of this lecture? It analyzes the, uh, the whole lecture and then all it can say, tell me what is the takeaway message from this lecture? Or what are the likely questions that can come out of this lecture? You, the staff, should also be taking these notes and asking the same questions. So you are predicting what the students are actually thinking I'm going to ask, and then be able to be very creative 
in how you are asking your questions so as to not to make sure that, because chat GDP, the questions it generates, it actually has the capability to answer them. So staff, we have to be completely on top of this game, all ahead of this game. Otherwise, the students are going to be, they will actually, their probability, you see they analyze, their probability, you see it's student, lecturers are now asking these questions and then doing research and actually figuring out what are the high probability actually that these questions were predicted by any of these soft chatbots to be able to get, have the student answers. So we have to be very active in, uh, in using these uh, softwares to be able to actually even predict our own questions and then be able to get, figure out if actually uh, the questions were used, what would be the answer? And then be able to figure out, because the students will probably know what the questions are, they'll probably know what the answers are. And they will get, be able to figure out uh, what are the uh, probably uh, moving forward. So I'd like to implore uh, the staff and indeed the administration and uh, uh, Professor Kakumba's office. There has to be workshops, there has to be um, seminars on really teaching uh, uh, staff to be able to be very cognizant on how powerful this tool are and be able to use it very creatively uh, in terms of their in terms of the way uh, they do their exams, their assignments, and their teaching. And I assume, and I see, I remember we used to have many years ago. We used to have courses on how to learn computers. So everybody would go learn how to do DOS and then what, you know, use Word, how to run. These courses on AI, I see them now as imperative for some time enough until everybody gets to understand what it is all about and what its capability are in order to be able uh, to be on top of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Serwarda, for those insights on uh, how AI has come and how we should all be on top notch of uh, these emerging technologies. It's not only AI, but more technologies are going to emerge. And therefore, uh, the teacher it has to be restless in trying to get on top of their game. And uh, this, of course, creates a lot of policy implications. It brings in a lot of policy implications. Can we still have a static university, a university that does not uh, that is not flexible? Because now uh, things are changing each and every day. Then how is the policy environment going to permit for these uh, changes that are rapidly occurring? Uh, so to discuss this, I think uh, Professor Umaru Kakumba, who is in the, in the, at the helm of policy making at McKellar University, academic policy making and administrative policies uh, can be able to give us an insight into what are those, what are the implications now for us as uh, higher education institutions, as universities, as Ministry of Education, as government, because we need to be guided on how we should be able to move within this automated world. The world is becoming more automated. We no longer wash our dishes using our hands at home. We have washing machines for dishes, now, even learning has become automated. What shall we do? What policy implications do we need to look at? Professor Omar Kakum. Uh, many thanks to you, uh, Professor Mayinda, the moderator. I also want to appreciate my, uh, the precarious speakers for sharing quite uh, a lot of reflections on uh, the challenge ahead or the challenge that is with us now uh, as higher education institutions, and not only for the teachers or the us who manage higher education institutions, but also for uh, the, 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 the country, the country that is absorbing our products. Because at the end of the day, the, 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 the user, the end user of uh, the university services in terms of teaching and learning is the, is, is, is the world of work, the industry. So what kind of products are we going to churn out if uh, the degrees, that we earn become paper degrees. If they just become mere papers 
Okay, fundamentally, you know that the role of the university is one, to, uh, to provide the quality of, uh, of teaching and learning, but also generation of knowledge through research. So people must be grounded in research, in the methodologies, must be able to have the analytical rigor of understanding world problems and what kind of interventions that can be generated through research, through data, to address problems that emerge from time to time. So if we are going to churn out products that are largely dependent on technologies, that uh, then we are, we, we, we are on the verge of uh, uh, issuing what we call paper degrees, the danger of fake degrees or paper qualifications, which are minus knowledge and skills. So this debate is coming in here. In spite of the fact that uh, many of the colleagues here have shared with us what they feel is are the, are the advantages of these uh, emerging uh, you know, intelligence systems, we have really a huge, huge responsibility, not just for the managers, but also for everybody to appreciate. Now, in terms of policy implications, I'll quickly give about two or three points on this and give my colleague also to share on the policy, Richard. Yeah, one of the critical aspects in the policy uh, is to address the issue, the problem of uh, what Diana talked about as uh, academic dishonesty and ensuring academic integrity and ensuring that the product that we churn out to the public is competent, has competences, has skills, has uh, uh, you know, critical thinking and problem solving capabilities to address situations that may not necessarily from time to time require uh, consulting the machine or the, the, the intelligence systems. So in terms of policy complications, one, the teacher, right, as everybody has said, we must start, first of all, we must start with the curricula. We must address review curricula and tune it in such a way that that curricula is learner-centered, that the curricula is designed in such a way that it has practical assessments, it has presentations where people come up and deliberate, and uh, share ideas, has some kind of uh, interview, critical thinking, analytical skills, problem solving. So the point I'm making is that the curriculum must be designed in such a way that it will uh, tease out the knowledge capabilities of the individual. At the end of the day, you are sure then you have the quality amidst uh, the help of these systems. Secondly, collaboration with the, between the artificial intelligence and the teachers. We need to empower the academics, the teachers, the lecturers, like Professor Serwad has emphasized, our policies should be now to empower to the academics. They must not be, they have to be to up the game. They must understand how these systems work. They can use them for generating good instruction, but they can also use them to, to detect uh, those that are simply misusing or quickly, uh, you know, uh, using uh, uh, what we call, um, uh, you, you, you know, being, be, being able to manipulate, manipulate and, and then do assignments without really putting in a lot of their knowledge and original contribution that is required. And, and thirdly, we must invest. Our policies should be tweaked towards the, the, the policy, the budget as a policy document, but the budget also as a planning uh, tool must be able to, 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 to invest in physical, um, you know, infrastructure, the ICT equipment, uh, such that we are able to um, uh, moderate the utility uh, of, uh, of, of these high technologies uh, into it. So you, you must be abreast with the software, the turnitin, the anti-plagiarism tests, and what have you. And, and then the other thing is to do with the review of teaching and learning policies, the examination malpractices, as we talk to them. Uh, somebody in the chat asked whether Makerere has uh, policies on these artificial intelligence or that kind of thing. The policies we have generally uh, are geared towards uh, ensuring academic honesty and that people uh, have original work and then uh, the integrity of the degrees we award. Okay, so the regulations against examination malpractices, irregularities, and so on. Even when you are to allow the open book, okay, or these multiple choice questions and what have you. Now, those ones are at danger because somebody will just get the soft version of the paper and punch it there. All of the answers will be provided. 
and somebody, a paper of 30 minutes, the multiple choice questions, can do it in about two, five, because the, the AI will have provided all of the answers from the objectives that are so. So intellectual property also is because chat GPT raises questions on who owns the data, on who owns the information. There is uh, uh, issues of IP, intellectual property. So the policies have to be uh, addressed in that way. The distance learning itself, the way we understand the traditional distance learning, the policies must also be adjusted uh, in such a way that you incorporate these opportunities for um, these systems that can allow uh, people from diversity to access knowledge and opportunity for teaching and learning. I'll give uh, the hand to my colleague quickly, uh, Richard Kajumbla, uh, to, 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 to share with us a few aspects along with the policy interventions and how we can be prepared. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kumba. Good afternoon, uh, colleagues from across who are listening to us and uh, watching this. Uh, just to add a little to what he has said, uh, there's uh, an issue which is uh, legal that is also coming up, uh, taking personal responsibility. Whatever we are designing the policies and what we're going to be doing is that at every one moment, we have to emphasize the fact that the student or the staff is personally liable to whatever AI uh, produces. That there's no room to say, I got this from chat GPT, therefore I'm not responsible. We have to remain with the responsibility. And therefore, it puts up in a situation where, as in a situation where we have to be so creative, we're not to create the kind of uh, learner or um, worker that the that Professor Kakumba has talked about. Then issues of inclusivity, inclusivity. As the eyes come in, we shouldn't leave anyone behind. So that's what, that's what has been another question. These policies should also be inclusive. Then issues of context, that most AIs are coming from developed countries. And so what happens? Are we being left out as, as developing countries? So what do we do again? Then we are, are we going to also have policies to internally, internally come up with our own uh, AI. Then of course, human resource policies are also affected. This in which as a staff, I can be disciplined when I use or misuse AI. That's an, also another issue. Listen to which we adopt uh, regarding um, the way we do our work. Then quickening the decision making process, because this is a, a wave that's already moving across the globe. How quickly can these policies be uh, designed and implemented? Because we know sometimes in institutions it takes quite some time. And so we are caught in a situation where we may have no policy on a specific item, but then the uh, AI is you know, moving. What are we going to do? Then sensitizing our people uh, regarding um, uh, these, uh, AI, first of all, AI and then the policies that are needed. Maybe we shall work with the stakeholders to be able to come up with uh, uh, different um, policies, the guide on how this can happen. I think, let me end there and we'll give chance to other colleagues to contribute. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, uh, contributors, panelists, uh, for the insights, the insights that you have provided on uh, the different issues on understanding uh, chat GPT, its implication to pedagogy, the practical concerns, and some uh, insights from outside and how we are supposed to prepare uh, to be able to embrace this technology while taking into consideration its, uh, uh, its uh, negative sides. I know that the audience has had a number of uh, questions in the chat and uh, i will ask uh, colleagues uh, who have been uh, monitoring the chat to be able to give us some of the uh, questions that have been in the chat i know that uh, people have put up their hands but uh, we wanted to first get uh, those questions that have been pertinent i know people have been perusing the chat they know questions that are cross-cutting so you can be able to uh, uh, to, to you can be able to summarize the question that can be able to take. I know there are so many questions on plagiarism. There are so many questions on no detection of plagiarism and so on. So all those questions, once they are answered, they will be answered at a go. So uh, Richard uh, and Godfrey, you have been watching the chat and uh, saving out. Can you be able to tell us some of the questions that have been uh, in the chat that are so pertinent for to be for us to be able to uh, to interact with Godfrey. 
Yes, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Minda. In the in the Q and A, there are questions that are there, but also there is a, a nice and interesting debate in the in the chat room where some of our council members, uh, University Council, are, and our colleagues from uh, Arizona State University and UISU and other international bodies who are also providing some chat. But I'm going to read some of the, the chats that came in into the, the Q and A questions first. Uh, uh, somebody is saying, yeah, somebody was asking, I think, uh, Professor Joseph, that if two people submit the same question, will it not bring back the same results? Like they were wondering, and this also came up in the chat, whether that is possible. Uh, I suppose that the teacher should be able to notice similarities in answers that students give to a common question. That would then raise, okay, something that they were thinking that they would be able to, teacher should be able to detect. Maybe that's. So, Godfrey, can you give questions that you can give to a panel member uh, to be able to answer? Okay. Because that there could be questions that could be directed to any of us. Uh, any of the panel members to be able to answer. Yeah. Okay. There's a, a one question which maybe I could ask. Uh, maybe this one is for Professor David. They were asking, can you talk about the use of chat GPT, chat GPT and plagiarism in learning? That's a company that was coming up. Maybe I don't right. know if uh, right. I can I can be very quick on that. Uh, Using uh, chat GDP or indeed any other chat box and you know, replicating the responses as it is, is actually considered plagiarism. So in fact, that's why in many universities out there, they haven't really generated necessarily new policies or guidelines uh, specific to AI because they find that if you have good, strong policies on cheating, plagiarism, this is actually enough for them to actually deal with AI and many other AI tools uh, that can actually take care of this. But it's plagiarism. But somebody asked me uh, in this chat whether there are tools that can actually detect uh, whether the response has been produced by AI. As I pointed out, Chat GTP itself has a tool to detect that actually the response has been generated by Chat GTP itself. But there are quite a lot of tools available to actually detect with, you know, they give a degree of probability that this actual response has been generated by Chat GTP. All you need to do is to paste, cut and paste whatever you think is generated by a, you know, AI, throw it into that tool it will be able to give you the probability that this was generated. It uses background algorithms in terms of sentence structure, repetition of sentences. Chat GDP tends to have patterns on how it uses words. And also ten sentences tend to be short, not long and complex. So there are, there are methods in which you can actually be able to know that this test, uh, this response has been generated by Chat GDP. And I think students should know that there are methods of generate and of figuring out that they are chat GDP. Somebody asked me, why, why, why do I use BARD? This webinar has concentrated on chat GDP. It, that is, it has its positives, but the downside is that staff may not be aware of so many other chat bots. So people are just looking at what is, can chat GDP generate in this question? Or if you put in this prop, what can chat GDP? But if a student is using a completely different chatbot, I use BAD just like uh, somebody asked me, why do I use BAD? Well, it's, it's, if, if you're, there are many browsers. So sometimes you use a Google browser or you use uh, Edge or Chrome to give you, an, an, you know, to give you a comparison of what is the outputs because all of them have different algorithms in which they are sourcing their data. So I really like the staff to actually broaden the AIs they are using because, it's, you know, because uh, somebody when is, you know, you are, you are give, you know, you are giving prompts and thinking that this has been generated by chat GDP, 
somebody can be using a very different chatbot and he's generating very different responses that you may not be aware of and you may pass him or her. Well, so I need you to broaden, just like you search with Chrome sometimes, you search with Edge, you search with other browsers. You need to know and get a feel of what the differences are. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank Good you very much. Question. Yes, another question to Professor Umar Kakumba. Somebody is just asking, is there any policy guideline at McKinney University that relate with AI currently? At Macquarie University, do we have uh, any policy that can relate with artificial uh, uh, AI? Well, particularly AI as uh, in, uh, in its specificity, no. But the policy that, uh, the broader policies that, uh, you know, can, like I said, uh, be able to mitigate against any kind of academic um, uh, dishonesty or to ensure academic integrity uh, contained in several of them. We have the teaching and learning policies, uh, which require people not to copy, not to, um, you know, um, when given assignments, they must be original, must be original work uh, generated from uh, original thought and maybe research, not word per word plagiarism. We have banned plagiarism uh, as a policy um, and, 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 you know, producing similar work, uh, that uh, copy and paste, all of those are included into uh, what is uh, unacceptable and can constitute what we uh, we regard, we describe as uh, irregularities and malpractices. So anybody definitely, we have existing policies uh, to detect, but also take care of uh, uh, those that transgress uh, into um, you know copying and plagiarism and producing work that is not original. Uh, be it dissertation, thesis, or coursework papers, or even be it in the examinations where people do, right? But the most important thing I, I think here is that uh, the academics and we in management should not sit to wait for people to make mistakes and then uh, net them and then subject them to disciplinary action. What is important is that uh, the academics must be at, up their game in understanding because we, are looked, we have looked at the pros and cons of um, uh, these uh, you know, uh, chat uh, systems or digital uh, intelligent systems that are providing information, quick information that people can have. So what we are saying is that uh, we must tweak and adjust our policies to recognize that people can use these research engines or search engines to, as part of the research, you cannot stop them because there is no way you'll stop somebody from researching or getting it. But what you want is the uh, identify the originality and the contribution or the new knowledge that somebody is making. So that's why I say that we need to really change quite a lot of policies, adjust them, but also make sure that we empower and train our academic staff to be able, and teachers and facilitators even curriculum design has to adjust. Okay, so policies related to curriculum design, the interactives, the engagement, the nature of assignment, all of those are policy regulated uh, spaces. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Omar Kumba. There are also some questions that are more connected with the, with the, the use of technology, like paraphrasing, how to paraphrase using chat GPT, and how to submit something of that kind on the, on the, I think that could require demonstrations. And perhaps we, that may not be answered, but there's one thing that is coming out, uh, which I have seen uh, from uh, one of the members in the chat, who is actually, uh, demonizing, demonizing as long as, as long as it is promoting learning. Uh, so that also came up in the chat and there were what, arguments. What, can you repeat that? Because uh, the network I think was a little bit problematic when you're speaking. Good, Frey. Hello? Okay. Yeah, is the, is that issue? So the Kind of, which you were off? talking about, but uh, some people okay. were saying the network was not good, yeah. Okay, uh, Professor, I can repeat, like in the chat, 
as people were trying to say that demonizing the concept of cheating uh, because of the chat GPT, one of the members said, cheating is not bad. Uh, as long as if it's promoting learning, then there's no problem. Let them cheat as long as they are, they are, there's promotion of learning. And that was coming from a professional teacher telling us that actually we can be able to move into that. I think, Prof, we could give an opportunity to those who have put up their hands in the chat okay. in the, yeah, to, to, be, to say something. Uh, there's Annette. Uh, I'm going to just cement Annette. I have enabled the, you can unmute. Of Peter. As a, hello. Okay. Yes, hello. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Peter, Peter Serubi Day, uh, uh, Department of Languages and Communication Studies here, Chambog University, but I also double as a student of PhD in linguistics from Chus, Makere University. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I would like to, 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 to also comment on chat GPT. And um, I'd like to argue that chat GPT is is a, a challenge to the concepts, to the existing concepts of learning. For example, in the presence of AI, what is the relevance of take home coursework assignments? Hello, am, 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 I, am, I, am, I, am I am I am I am I am I clear? You are clear. We are hearing you very well. Yes, you I was asked. I was yes, I was just probing. I was. I've just, I've just got interesting questions here that in the presence of chat GPT, what is the relevance of take home assignments anymore? I mean, if I am to conduct a coursework assignment where learners are to take the work for three weeks or two weeks or four weeks, I mean, what, how, how verifiable, how, how credible is this information when learners are exposed to chat GPT. It's just a question, a rhetorical question for every one of us to think about. That's number one. Number two, I think it's high time we subject every learner to a Viva Voci. I mean, Viva should no longer be a prerogative or a preserve of master's degrees and PhDs. I mean, there is need to redefine what to know means. Now to know no longer means the ability to produce only the intellectual information that somebody has got, but to, to verify by, 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 by you know, presenting that information in new contexts from examples from real life away from writing and reading. I mean, there is a need for a viva voce at least even at undergraduate level. I think that should also be thought about. I mean, to corroborate the information, if the learner really learned what was taught, then they should be able to articulate and use examples, novel examples in, in, their, own, in their own new, um, new context and new environments. Otherwise, if, if, if assessment only remains on writing and reading and ma marking examination scripts and marking scripts and scripts, I think we might fall short of, of verifying whether the information is correct or not. And then lastly, lastly, I think now that there is a need to make every course have an internship. Why? Because ChatGPT to me is telling us that one who knows it is one who can apply it. That there ought to be new avenues of making our learners do what they claim they know. And one of the avenues, I, I dare say, is to allow them to do internship. I mean, any course without internship, with time, by the this advent of by this advent of AI, will will render us incompetent or it will render us irrelevant there is need i submit thank you yeah thank you thank you very much thank peter you very much uh, peter yeah, yeah. and i think peter has been calling for authentic assessment 
we must turn away from our user assessment to what we now call authentic assessment. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think wanted, Annette. I, I wanted to respond to Peter though, uh, mm -hmm. Paul. Mm. Yeah, Peter raises very good points, uh, Paul. Uh, but Peter in his submission, he also is giving solution. But actually, ass assignments, my experience when I was in, in, in the US and I'm trying to tech, talk to Texture, they, do, they don't see assignments, even take our assignments, even open book. There are teachers who give examination, open book examination, and they clearly allow you to use open AI. You, here, here's a trick, Peter. You really need, and they have been uh, coursework and, uh, and uh, seminars to lecturers on actually how to give assignments that cannot be answered by chat GDP. The, the point here is that the lecturers need to get a very good understanding on what are the capabilities of chat GDP and where are its limitation. And therefore design, for example, uh, I was given a very good example. Um, it, a, a lecturer told me, a professor told me now, he's, he's, he's got a way of designing his assessments. He gives a classroom, a class, a paper, a, a, a paper produced, uh, you know, written in, in, in a journal. And then he says, he, used, he asks them to do homework assessment to actually, you can go use GetChat GDP, whichever AI use that paper to ask questions based on this paper that give your real life experience on how to use this methodology. He has already figured out chat GDP will never answer that question. So we need to actually ant up our game on how to be able to actually give, and by the way, Ugandan education system is so prone to chat GDP regurgitation because most of us have been taught on normalizing factor and rejectigating fact. We now need to give questions or teaching whereby you have to do reasoning and adaptive answers that are not straight cut, you know, cut, cut, you know, what you call cooker cut answers. So we can still give assignments. As long as you, as a lecturer, has already given up, figured out how, what can Chad GDP be able to do, and it cannot be able to do, and it's very easy to, to figure out who try to use Chad GDP, and then not be able to make any progress or meaning out of it. So uh, I think it is, uh, but I do agree with Peter that new methods of assessment may also be very useful now, which actually probably one would say a long overdue to really examine somebody's listening cap capability using tools that are available to solve problems uh, that are not necessarily very descriptive. So I think uh, assignments will still be very useful as long as you are able to know what are the capabilities and be able to figure out what actually chat GDP or these AIs can be able to do or not. No, uh, uh, thank, no, thank, thank, thank. Uh, yes. we, we ran we ran out of our time for this webinar, but uh, I, I really don't know whether we can go, we can stretch any further, uh, but we the time is is actually long spent, but uh, you can be able to to give some more chance to maybe some two more people who have put up their hands to to comment and ask questions, and then we can be able to call it. A webinar ended. Okay, thank you very much. I know Prof. that there are a lot of interesting. We have a lot of interesting uh, comments, scenarios, and but this is just the mm -hmm. starter. We shall be organizing more of these uh, more of these webinars to 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 get more insights. This is just a starter, and uh, the interest is really very very high. As you can see, that we've hit more than five hundred participants. Yeah. Good. Okay, thank you very, thank you very much, and thank you, Professor David Sarwanda, for that uh, insightful example. And I see that uh, 
our our council member Diana was actually saying we need now unit based trainings in this area so that we can learn how to set the real questions that chat GTP cannot what cannot be able to, to find. But let's allow Anit, uh, Anit Musmenta, his uh, hand was up. Anit, and then we shall also maybe ask uh, Anthony in Subuga. But Anit, okay. Anthony, maybe Anthony can be able to answer. Anit is not there. Unmute. They should be. They should unmute. Are you, they are, are able, they able to, to unmute. They are able to unmute. Yes. Yes, in Subuga. Maybe I go to Henry. 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 I think people put okay. up their hands. Yes. Henry. Yes, you Gali can Wango. get me. Yeah. Thank yes, you so much. I am Galiwango. I am a staff at the School of Education and I'm also a PhD student at the College of Edu Agriculture. Yeah, me, I am very happy and optimistic about this tool. Um, I'm always, uh, well, we are, we, we are both colleagues in Makere, but uh, uh, this idea of uh, staff sitting on students' work, things like taking two, three months without reading the proposal. Don't you think that GPT could be the way to go? Because, I mean, if, 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 if you can subject this uh, text to that to that proposal, it could I mean give you a guideline, because many complain or many pretend to be busy and doing their personal projects, but the student is waiting and sitting and waiting for comments from the supervisor. So I think going this way could be the way to go. But I mean we shouldn't leave all the work to into Chat GPT. We have because I mean we can override that Chat GPT. It is just a tool to enable us to go on or work as smartly and quickly. And then, um, if you remember very well, we had the COVID phase where we were tasked to uh, give scenario questions. I mean, because the students were home and they're using, um, using their laptops to do the, the exam. So we also changed our examination I mean, tactics. And I mean, why can't we also rethink the way we are to do the examination such that it stops at asking the memory, 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 to now asking questions that are, you know, fifth generation. If you sit in international presentation for PhD students, they are moving away from the traditional impacts of effects of ETC in research. Let us rethink even the way we do work at Marquette. I think, well, I think I'm running out. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think for, uh, Professor Mila said that uh, we have run out of time, and I think maybe we could do uh, the last part of the, the discussion is basically uh, the wrap up, which is uh, supposed to be given by, uh, by the DBC AA, uh, the final closing remarks, so that we can be able to close up, unless Professor Mila is still there. Over to you, DBCA. Uh, many thanks, colleagues. I think uh, this has been quite uh, has been very very interesting. I must be sincerely appreciative of uh, the the colleagues joining us within the country, within Makerere, across the continent, and uh, from our partners in Arizona State University and uh, those from other institutions within uh, South Africa and and quite a number that is participating in this. This is a very, very interesting conversation. While the theme was about chat GPT, we've uh, broadened it, the panelists have broadened it to appreciate the artificial intelligence and all of these uh, intelligence uh, systems or such as engines that can be able to uh, provide the quick information and knowledge uh, that can easily be used for people, especially uh, students when they are responding to um, academic work. So I think uh, the debate will rage on, the conversations will come, as I said at the beginning, the Institute of Open Distance and E-Learning, we much, uh, very much appreciate you uh, working with my office because the output at the end of the day is to create awareness, is to create sensitization and appreciation about the advantages and uh, uh, great uh, you know, um, opportunities that we can leverage 
uh, utilizing these emerging technologies and smart systems, but also in a way look at the uh, drawbacks or kind of challenges that uh, you know, we can face. At the end of the day, this world deserves better. For us in educational institutions, we must be able to churn out products that can represent the competences, the skills, the knowledge, the capabilities that can address uh, the world, world problems and development needs. That is the, 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 the fundamental you know, um, expectation that everybody has. Our university is still worth. Some people are asking, do we still need teachers when we have this chat GPT and other systems that can easily give us information and learn? Yes, we need the teachers, we need the universities, but the universities must adjust, the curriculum must change, the teachers must adjust and, and enlist new ways of testing people and seeking out and receiving out competences or teasing out uh, you know, ways on how people can be confirmed to have uh, undertaken and uh, being, be, 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 uh, to have equipped themselves with the skills that the world needs. Uh, colleagues, I don't need to intend this uh, anymore. I want to thank you so much, the panelists, Professor David Serwada, Professor of Public Health, colleagues from Iodel, uh, Professor Muyinda, the moderator, Godfrey Mayende, Professor Valiku Dembe, the Dean of Computing, Informatics Technology, uh, Richard Kajumbla, uh, colleagues uh, Jamia, and all everybody that has joined us, please look forward uh, to the next uh, you know, conversation. At the end of the day, the university and uh, every our stakeholders will appreciate that this is an animal with, with, with around us, that we must be able to find ways of working with it and leveraging the advantages, but also mitigating the dangers that come with it. I thank you so much for this. May the good Lord bless you all. And I wish to declare uh, this uh, uh, webinar uh, closed for today. Until then, uh, thank you so much. May the good Lord bless you all. Amen. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Prof, you are. Yeah, I'm just looking at the